Uh, let's start this. I'm recording. So um, everybody, you know who I am, Anjanette Levy. Up, up top, or I think what's going to be up top on your view is Mac Mariani, political science aficionado at Xavier University. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to I'm trying to like boost him up a little bit just because he and I are both talking about how we don't really know what's going to happen or anything. And Norman Guerin from Am I saying that right, Norman? Yeah, perfect. You're from Ireland. What part of Ireland are you from? Uh, I live in the, in the city in Dublin. Um, I'm about about a 25 minute drive, which isn't too far for you know for the city. Um, it's on a sort of a small suburb. So, yeah, I actually work for a Canadian stroke American company. I work for Caterpillar. Mm. My so. son loves Caterpillar. He loves construction equipment. So he even has like a hat and everything. Okay. What I'll do is I'll maybe send me your, your, your work address and I'll send you some merchandise from. Oh, yeah, oh, we'll see. It might be a big conflict. I might get in trouble. But... So, Norman, um, I guess I'm interested. We we wanted to talk today. Um, obviously, I'm a big history buff, sort of. Um, not, I shouldn't say that in front of a professor because a professor would probably know way more about history than I do. But um, I've always loved history and politics. So, I wanted to talk about uh, the presidential race and um, the confirmation hearings for Amy Coney Barrett. So I, Mac, if you don't mind, first of all, I wanna ask Norman. So Norman, what do people like you or people over in Ireland, what do you guys think of what's going on over here with the presidential race? Do, are you guys paying attention? Yeah, we are. Um, because in the past, uh, the US presidents have had a big influence in Ireland with our peace process, which, you know, Obviously, Bill Clinton had a big say in that, and he was he was a great ambassador for our country during that. And then, obviously, Obama, when he came in, he still had some great links with Ireland. Um, you know, he has he has a petrol station locally named after Barack Obama um, because his his family are from Ireland. Um, look, you know, the, you know, there's people. People in Ireland have their opinion of Donald, Donald Trump. I, I, I tell a story. I have a, we, have a, we have a lady that comes in and does a bit of cleaning for us once or twice every sort of month. And she absolutely idolizes Donald Trump. You can say nothing about him. Really? Um, yeah. Anything that has been brought up, um, you know, slanders against him. She defends it. She doesn't think any of it's true. It's all false. It's all fake news. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I personally, I don't have any time for him whatsoever. I think he's quite obviously controversial. I don't want to say too much, obviously, because we're being recorded and we have a lot of trolls <laughs> sending me nasty messages. But yeah, no, for you know, look, I'm just glad he's not our president or our as we have over here in Ireland. We've seen called T Shock, who runs our country. So I'm glad he's not running or an individual of his type running our country. Okay. So, Matt, given what Norman just said, as you can expect, I'm sure people around the world um, are watching this election, you know, probably not as closely as we are, but they are watching it. It has a huge impact on, on things that happen around the world. So, Mac, um, I'm looking at polls that, and, you know, I'm seeing all these polls that say that Biden is way ahead, that Ohio is neck and neck, Ivanka Trump is coming here to Ohio um, on Friday, I think is what I read last night on the internet. So, Mac, all these polls say, you know, Biden should have this in the bag, but then I turn on cable news last night and there's this huge crowd for President Trump uh, at a campaign rally in um, Pennsylvania, one in Florida. So, so what's going on? Because these things don't seem to comport. Well, I, you know, I think it's interesting that there's a, you know, from my perspective, I think we've all been kind of broken by 2016, right? And so in 2016, we were, you know, everybody, I think, as we we're heading into that election, looked at the polls, looked at the direction of the race, looked at what they were seeing, and by all kind of previous standards of how we judge elections and assess things, we could say with all confidence that Donald Trump wasn't going to win that election, and then he did, and that, I think, makes us very hesitant, I think, um, to um, believe what we're seeing. Um, on the other hand, um, what we're seeing right now, I think, I, I think we can only speak to what we're seeing right now. And I think that is, um, there is a tension between the polls, 
uh, which would show a fairly consistent and if not growing Biden lead um, and, um, enth and, and what seems to be enthusiastic crowds for Trump. And um, uh, part of that is, I think, a, a reflection of the strategy that, uh, that Biden has to kind of run out the clock. He sees this as an election to, that, uh, uh, where he has an advantage. Um, and the less he makes this election about him, and the more this election is about Donald Trump, the better. Um, you know, if you, if you look at some of the polls, there's this bizarre sort of, of, of um, uh, dichotomy, I guess, of um, what, are you better off than, now than you were four years ago? And 56% of Americans say, yes, I'm better off than I was four, four years ago. And this is in the midst of a pandemic, right? So the, the Trump, you know, the, the Trump economy and the, and the benefits of the, uh, the, that Americans saw in the economy generally uh, tends to put Trump in a very historically strong position. Um, but on the other hand, when you ask about, you know, do you like Trump? Do you think he's pre presidential? Do you approve of Donald Trump? His numbers are, are tremendously low. And so in some ways, it's, it, it's Trump versus Trump, right? It's, it's this tension between the record that he's amassed as um, in terms of policy, economic policy in particular, which prior to the, to the uh, pandemic, uh, would have put him in an extraordinarily strong position. And Trump, the man who people generally, you know, as you're hearing in Ireland, probably similarly, uh, have a lot of qualms about. Um, something about his his lack of decorum or presidential, presidential behavior really rubs people the wrong way. Um, and then you also have this COVID issue, which is, you know, obviously whether Trump is, um, is a, uh, whether Trump is handling that correctly and is, you know, to what extent is he to blame. So, you know, you've got this, this election right now about Trump, and I think that puts Biden in the driver's seat. Um, it's not about Biden. It's not about the left. It's not about um, policies. Uh, it's not even about court packing or anything like that. Where, um, and Trump, for, what, for the most part, seems satisfied with making it about him. I mean, every, every day we have a new story that, that is based on something Trump said. Um, he seems to be very undisciplined as a campaigner, um, which I think lends itself to, you know, where we are. So Joe, Joe Biden was here in Cincinnati on um, Monday. Um, he spoke at Union Terminal. Obviously, the number of people inside w was limited. It's, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. You're not supposed to be near each other. Um, so, but it does seem like there's a big imbalance though. I, it's just hard, I think it's hard to tell what's going to happen. You've got all this absentee, you mail in absentee early voting happening in Ohio at least, and in other parts of the country. So you've got all this happening and that seems to favor Democrats, but you know, and the Republicans seem to be lagging behind on that. So it's like, what's gonna happen? I mean, are you really telling me that all these Republicans are gonna show up on election day and make this, even, I, I just don't know. I don't know. I think it's a really weird thing. It's like back in 2016, you would, I covered a Hillary Clinton rally down at the Roebling Bridge and there were like 200 people there and that didn't seem like a lot of people, maybe 300. And then like right after that, I covered a rally at US Bank Arena and I think, I think I did, I don't remember. Maybe it was somewhere else, but there were huge, you know, it was a huge crowd of people. I think it was US Bank Arena. So doesn't it seem weird, though, that we can't figure this out? And then you watch the news and it's just all of this stuff, all this contradictory stuff. Well, and COVID throws a, throws a wrench in it, too. I think the Democrats um, have, you know, um, have certainly been more embracing of the idea that, the, listen, we need to be very cautious about the virus. And I think that um, um, Republicans have been much more kind of led by Trump. Uh, along the lines of, listen, we can't let the virus dominate us. We got to open things up a little bit. We got to feel comfortable going out, spending money, doing all that stuff. And that's translated into two very different strategies when it comes to, um, you know, winning this election. The Democrats ha have traditionally, at least by my, you know, by my personal experience, their get out the vote operation every four years is, is phenomenal. Um, and, and it's led by young people, college students out there working, you know, they're, they're out there volunteering. And this last, this election, the Democrats made a decision to sort of pull back on, on the get out the vote effort. They didn't want people going out door to door um, because that would send a, the perception of, um, you know, potentially putting people at risk and certainly cut against their, their arguments about, um, uh, about the need for kind of stricter lockdowns and, and being a little bit more cautious with regard to the virus. Whereas Republicans um, have, have 
kind of used um, that kind of opening to 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 push uh, forward with get out the vote efforts um, beyond what they usually have. So I think that um, Republicans have kind of gone all in on, on get out the vote efforts, and in part that's that's only increased as we've seen the money differential between the candidates expand. The Biden campaign is very well funded. They're spending a ton of money on advertising. Um, the Trump campaign doesn't have that kind of money. And so they're sort of saying, listen, we're, we're actually pulling back some of our ads and just going to keep funding our get out the vote operation and hope these people show up on election day. So it's really these sort of two different models, one based on um, sort of broad based messaging, adver advertising, um, and um, in early voting, and then the other one based on a get out the vote operation geared towards election day. Um, you know, that's a, that's a pretty risky, I think it's a pretty risky bet for, for the president um, because, you know, getting everybody to show up on one particular day is, is, um, is a cha it's a challenge um, and it's, it's a logistical challenge to, to make sure um, that everybody actually shows up who, who would be willing to pull the, pull the lever. And I think Democrats by extending the, um, the campaign out so they've got, a, you know, almost a month to vote. Um, that gives them lots of opportunities to get people to the voting booth. So it's, you know, the, the Democrats have a big lead based on the, you know, if you actually tallied those votes right now, uh, the question is, you know, can, can the Trump, uh, the Trump supporters, will enough of them show up on election day? Sure. Or mail-in ballots or whatever. Um, so Norman, are you guys paying attention to the Supreme Court um, hearings of uh, Amy Coney Barrett at all? Or are you guys not really tuned into that because it doesn't have... Yeah, there's a small bit on the news on, on Sky, but not, not generally on the local news channels. Uh, COVID has taken too much of it up at the moment because of, we've, we've now new lockdowns coming into force in certain parts of the country. So that's really taking over a lot of the news media space at the moment. But definitely on Sky, there's a lot on about it, but I haven't been watching it at all. Okay. So um, what do you think, um, Mac, about how it's going? I guess my perception... Obviously, this is night and day between what happened with Brett Kavanaugh in 2018. I mean, I, I like watching it because I think it's interesting and I like history. And um, I've actually, I think you can learn a lot just listening to a law professor ask these questions, whether you like her answers or not. So, um, gosh, what do you what do you think? I mean, she's going to be confirmed. They have the votes. Uh, yeah, it, it certainly seems that way, and I, I think to some extent the Democrats have have. Uh, um, I think they're they're being a little bit cautious. You know, back in uh, back in September of 2018, right before the uh, the midterm elections, um, there's kind of a perception that the Kavanaugh affair actually really hurt Democrats' fortunes in some of the some really tight Senate races, um, and and mobilized the Republican base just before the election. Um, this coming as close to the election as it does. I think there's a, and the fact that Amy Comey, Comey Barrett um, is, um, um, you know, first of all, she's a, she's a woman. And the, the idea of, a, you know, of, of these mostly male senators attacking a woman would probably not send the right message right before the elect, right before the election. Um, I think the, um, so there's, um, there's, there's that gender aspect of it that also plays a role. And I think they just were, they were, they were, they felt like they maybe play, overplayed their hand with Kavanaugh a bit um, and it hurt them. And so now it's, listen, the, the, the big prize is, no, is on November 3rd. They, they don't have the votes to win this, to really stop this nomination. Um, and it doesn't look like there, there's going to be any, you know, last minute surprise, although I, that's why they call them last minute surprises. Um, so I think that the, the Democrats are, are, are essentially going to, going to say, listen, we're going to announce our objections. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're, we're not going to just roll over um, because that would make our side angry. But we're also not, not going to overplay our hand because we don't, we don't want to make this election about our behavior in this nomination process, right? Anything that distracts from Trump is something that's going to hurt the Democrats um, because they view, they view Trump as their, as their best asset um, when this election is about his personality and his, um, you know, and, and the way he's sort of behaving on the campaign trail. And, you know, she's got seven kids or six kids sitting behind her and probably this would not be a good look to really attack the lady in front of her children. <laughs> and obviously, I mean, I think that the lasting image, I told you this the other day, is that, that it, I think the image that we're going to take out of that is her holding up that empty sheet of notes. The fact that she's able to 
respond to a multitude of questions about about a, a variety of cases and and the history of the court and you know and she does all this without anything without any you know I've got I've got notes here right I can barely get through this interview. <laughs> um, so you know and that she's able to answer these really difficult and challenging questions and she knows the law far better than any of the senators who are up there and they've all they're all speaking from notes um, it, you know, I think that that's a that's a pretty powerful image about qualifications. And if we're just looking at whether or not she's qualified for the court, I think the answer is going to be yes. Um, now, whether or not she passes some ideological test that the Senate the, 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 the senators have, that's a different question. Obviously, the, the Republicans seem to have the votes on that one. Yeah, I think the notepad thing was really impressive. I, when she held that up, I was like, wow, that's kind of like a mic drop moment, you know. So uh, Norman, anything else to add? I think we're gonna wrap it up here. So, and I'll oh. put this later on. No, 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 just stay safe. That's all we can do. Yeah, Norman, I'm so glad you could join us. Um, I was expecting more people to join after yesterday's comments, but I guess, you know, people, they're busy or whatever, but I'm so glad you could come on. Um, your kitchen looks oh. fabulous behind you, by the way. I always love seeing people's backgrounds. But um, I, uh, we'll have to do this again sometime. Is everything going okay with COVID over there in Ireland? Yeah, it's tough. It's in the north of Ireland. Um, we have a place, obviously, in the north of Ireland called Derry, and that, that has the biggest uh, uh, rate of COVID in the world at the moment. Um, so the north of Ireland is going into lockdown on Friday, and they reckon tomorrow we have um, a sort of a government run sort of team that are going to meet tomorrow about locking down certain parts of the border counties. Uh, in Ireland, but the, the rates are going crazy again, you know, there's, we had, you know, compared to the US, obviously it's quite low, but for population, um, over the weekend, between Saturday and yesterday, we had nearly two and a half thousand people infected, you know, and 14, 14 deaths, so it's, it's quite high for a population of four million. Um, but it's it's scary. It's scary for it's scary for older people, you know. It really is, and yeah, yeah, probably like the states, younger people don't particularly care. You know, they think they're immune, which is um, which is also scary. But the economy has gone right down again. You know, we're obviously officially in a recession. Three months of of a negative. You know, you go into a recession, but um, you know, shops are closing. We've local shopping centres. Shops are all closed, so it's, it's worrying, you know. I just can't wait to go back to the States again. That's well, I can't trap. wait to go back to Ireland again. I can't, I mean, I have to imagine a big, um, a, a, a substantial part, not, you know, less maybe so than before, a substantial part of the economy there is, uh, is, is tourism, right? I mean, a lot, ton of Americans, uh, Chinese, uh, Japanese uh, tourists, I'm sure tourists from other parts of Europe. I mean, uh, Ireland's a wonderful place. So I hope we can get, you know, get, get through this virus and get people back in the pubs. <laughs> yeah, the, the pubs are closed at the moment, <laughs> you know, and, and there will be for another three weeks. You know, it is, you know, and, and tourism is a huge part of our business, our, of our economy. Like, you know, we have, we have three main airports, Dublin, Cork and Limerick. Cork and Limerick are, are non-existent at the moment. There's nobody flying in and out. But if you go onto the Dublin Airport website, you'll see planes coming in from the States every single day and flying out to the States every single day, you know. But, you know, obviously there's there's a, a green list and a red list. Obviously the US is on that red list. Um, you know, there's not many countries, you know, that are on the green list, I think. Iceland is one of them, um, Iceland, Finland, I think Litvi Lit 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 Lithuania, I think is another one, but you know, it's, 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 it's worrying, you know, it's, it's worrying that we can't travel, you know, I should have been in Canada uh, last week with work, I couldn't go and, you know, and it's, um, it's just hard to try and do, do calls like this with, 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 with with other fellow workers, you know, it's just difficult. But listen, we're, we're all adapting, you know, we're all adapting, you know. It's, it's hopefully, hopefully within 12 months we'll have, we'll have a vaccine and we can all be going around a little bit sort of, you know, not, not as protective of what we are now, wearing face masks and sanitizing. But I think that's going to be, our social distancing could be around for a number of years, you know. Yeah, definitely. I think it's probably going to be part of the new normal. And maybe that's not such a bad thing if 
you know, a little bit of social distancing can actually um, keep people healthier just from other things too. I mean, maybe we can get together and hang out, but not, you know, just be so yeah. together and stuff. Yeah. All yeah. right, cool. Well, thanks so much, Norman. I've never been to Ireland. I've been to London twice. Um, I love London. Um, yeah. One of these days, I'm going to have to make it to Ireland, but um, love seeing you, meeting you in person via yeah. Zoom, sort of, or whatever. Um, but <laughs> let's do this again sometime. And Mac, um, yeah. let's do this next week. And, um, you know, maybe we can figure out how to do the Facebook thing. <laughs> <then>. <laughs> Wednesday, Wednesday afternoons are great. So looking forward to it. <laughs> it's not our fault. <laughs> I think there's a Facebook problem because we tried. Yeah. I mean, we tried like the Dickens yesterday. All right. Thanks, guys. Good to see you. Thanks a lot. Take nice care. Norman, see you, Jeanette. Take care. Bye-bye.